Hey there, pre-med. Let's talk about the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. This is another place where biology meets math on the MCAT, much like Mendelian genetics. In fact, I put these two together in the 1C category of evolutionary biology. Now, these questions don't come up a lot on the MCAT, but when they do, they can be what we call time sucks, where if we don't know how to do the math, but we're like, we're sure we can get this right, we'll end up spending two, three, four minutes on a question on Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium when really we should only be spending one. So in this video, we're going to go through how to simplify the math and to look for clues in the question stem to make sure that we're using the right equations the right math skills, and of course, eliminating as we go so we save time on testing. Let's get started with our practice question. Here's our MCAT style practice question. Go ahead, pause this video, read it, try it on your own first, and then we'll walk through this together. Okay, the question goes, in an isolated population of 10,000 armadillos, 900 are homozygous for the recessive allele R1. Assuming Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, what percentage of the population of armadillos is heterozygous? The actual population of animals is arbitrary. I just chose armadillos because my husband's favorite animal is armadillos. On the MCAT, it will probably be any population of animals or insects, but it's probably not going to be humans. And the reason why is because when we assume Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, we're also assuming a lot about this population that is very rare to happen in any population, but particularly in humans. So before we dive into how to approach this question mathematically, we do want to talk a little bit about this assumption that we're making here. Whenever they say assume Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, they're letting us know we have an isolated population. This is the MCAT kind of saying, hey, we're letting you know that even though these populations are not ideal for this equation, we can use our typical equations on testing. So what are the assumptions for Hardy-Weinberg? Pretty much it's that the population can't change because we're calculating, the whole point of this question is we're trying to calculate the amount of recessive alleles versus dominant alleles and heterozygotes versus homozygous dominant or homozygous recessive individuals. And so in order to do that, the population can't change. It needs to be really stable. It needs to be isolated where there's no armadillos moving in or moving out or leaving the population because that would change the math. It means that we can't be choosing our mates or having bias in our mate choice because that's gonna throw off our math. And we have to make sure the population's big enough for the math to work. As you all know from research, if we have too low of an n value, a population size, then random error or chance is going to have a much bigger impact. And again, it will throw off our math. So all we're saying with Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is this, it's this kind of idealized state where we have this very isolated large population with completely random mating, no natural selection, right, and no kind of evolutionary shifts that are happening. Now this doesn't ever happen in real life for most populations, but these numbers are actually still valuable to give us rough estimates of what's going on in the population. So once in a while they'll say, assume the human population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium for this moment in time, and we'll calculate the recessive alleles. It's not to calculate the exact number, it's to give us a rough estimate about what's going on. So what are these fun equations that I keep referencing? There are two equations for Hardy-Weinberg. The first is P plus Q equals 1. And the second is P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1. Now if you recall your algebra, you may notice, hey, this second equation is just taking this first equation and squaring it, right? Because p plus q squared is p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1, because 1 squared is still just 1. So if you're curious, we're just taking this first equation and squaring it to give us a little bit more information. Well, equation 1 is telling us how many dominant alleles versus recessive alleles are in the population. And for pretty much the most part, you can either have a dominant or a recessive, right? We can have big R, a dominant allele, or a recessive allele. Those are our two options for alleles. And so they need to add up to 100% of the alleles in the population. So we're going to kind of use the word 1 and 100% interchangeably here. And the same way we're going to use the decimals and the percentages interchangeably when we do the math. 
So P, P here is referring to the percent of dominant alleles, percent of dominant alleles. And I'm being really clear that we're using the word allele here and not person. All right, we're going to talk about that. The Q is the percentage of recessive alleles. And quick reminder about uh, evolutionary genetic dominant versus recessive. If we have one dominant allele, we're going to express the dominant phenotype. If we want to express the recessive phenotype, we need two recessive alleles, right? Two of them. So this is not referring to people. This is just saying, hey, if we like took all the alleles in the population and just stacked them together, this is how much are dominant and this is how many are recessive. Okay. So this is talking about just straight up the alleles, not who they're in in terms of people, right, or how many, just saying, hey, if we took all the alleles in the population and isolated them, here's how many are dominant and here's how many are recessive. So what about people, right? Because this is telling us that there's 900 armadillos that are homozygous for the recessive allele. So that's where this second equation comes in. P squared is referring to the percentage of homozygous dominant people, all right, people or individuals, right, in the population, organisms. So this would be, if we're using R here as our example, this would be the number, the percentage of people that have big R, big R as their genotype for this gene. Our Q squared, if you can guess, is our percentage of homozygous recessive individuals or people. So homozygous recessive people. So that would be little r, little r in our example here. Who are we missing? We're missing our heterozygotes. So 2pq refers to our percentage of heterozygotes in the population. So heterozygote people, and that would be denoted as big r, little r, right? One of each for heterozygote. So these are our three options for this gene in the population, right? We can either have big r, big r, homozygous dominant, big r, little r, heterozygote, or little r, little r, homozygous recessive. So in total, this needs to add up to 100% of the population of the people, just like our alleles need to add up to 100% of the alleles. So you can see now why the second equation is the square of the first equation, because each of us has two alleles, right? Each of us has two alleles for each gene. So the math isn't going to be as simple as P plus Q because we have several different combinations that can happen once we get to the human level, right? Or the individual level or the organism level like we have here. Okay, so we have what each of our variables mean. This is the key because now all we need to do is figure out which variable they gave us and which variable they're asking for. So all this takes is careful reading and then based on the information they give us, we should be able to then solve for whichever variable they ask us, right? We only have two variables here. So in this question, they said 900 out of our 10,000 armadillos are homozygous for the recessive allele. We only use the word homozygous for individuals, so that must mean we're not in equation one, we're in equation two, and we're talking about homozygous for the recessive allele. So which variable do we need? Q squared, that's what we're provided, right? And Q squared in this case is equal to Q squared, not Q, right? Because it's about the people. Q squared is equal to 900 over 10,000, right? Not just 900, because we have to take into account the whole population, right? We're saying, hey, what percentage of people out of the total population are homozygous recessive? So we do need to always take into account the base population. So this is how many out of the total are homozygous recessive. So that's what we're provided is Q squared. And then what are we asked for? Well, we're asked for what percentage of the population are heterozygous. So what are we asked for? 2PQ. All right. So all we need to do is solve for P and we're good to go. Now, you may be tempted to use this equation, right? Because two of our variables are in here. But personally, I find that to be way harder math than just adding two numbers together, right? So my recommendation, if they give you a Q squared or a P squared, is to get down to Q because then it's very easy to solve for P and then we can just multiply two times P times Q. All right, so that's what we're gonna do. And I'm gonna show you a cool math trick here. Q squared equals 900 over 10,000. So let's go ahead and simplify this number a little bit first. We'll get rid of two zeros. So now we have nine over 100 or 
0.09. Now I'm leaving both here because the math works for both of these scenarios. In fact, I'm going to rewrite it as 9 times 10 to the negative 2 here to show you how the math is really cool. All right, so here we go. We've got q squared. What do we need to do to get to q? We need to take the square root of both sides. Doesn't that feel obnoxious? We have to take the square root of this fraction or of this decimal, or I rewrote this decimal in scientific notation here. Don't panic. There's a couple cool tricks. The first one here is that you can separate the square root into the numerator and denominator. So we can do square root of 9 over square root of 100. And that would give us the square root of 9 is 3. The square root of 100 is 10, right? Because 10 times 10 is 100. It's just the inverse of squaring. And so 3 over 10 would give us 0.3, right? Or 10 to the negative 1. Now, what if we decided to do it this way, right? We didn't like the fraction, so we put it as 9 times 10 to the negative 2. Well, we can do the same thing and separate the mantissa. Remember, the mantissa is the big number in the front here, uh, in front of the exponent. So we can take the square root of the mantissa and then the square root of the exponent. So same thing, square root of 9 is 3. And then here's a cool trick. If you're taking the square root of an exponent, you just divide the exponent by 2. <laughs> So 10 to the negative 2 divided by 2, negative 2 divided by 2 is negative 1, so it'll become negative 1. And that gives us, again, 0.3. So two different ways to do this math gets you the same results. As a cool rule, this will always work, okay? So if you have 10 to the 4, and you take the square root of 10 to the 4, you're just dividing it by 2, it would just be 10 to the 2. If you take the cubed root of something, let's say you're taking the cubed root of 10 to the 9, all you're doing is dividing by 3 now, so it would be 10 to the 3. So just some cool things where we don't have to stress out about the square root so much, even if we have exponents handy. I personally find that to be easier than dealing with decimals, right? You've seen me, if you've seen me in other videos, you've seen me always turn things into scientific notation. All right, so now we have this fun math, right? We can do that fast on test day now that we have that trick, is q is equal to point. Three. So now we can plug 0.3 into our equation. P plus 0.3 equals 1. 1 minus 0.3 is going to give us P equals 0.7. Okay, we're almost there. See, we're, we're cooking right along. Now all we need to do is plug our two values in. So we can do 2 times 0.7 times 0.3. Now, these numbers may be a little difficult, so personally for me, I'm looking at my answers here and realizing that all the numbers are different, pretty much, so I'm not going to worry about the decimal sign. I'm just going to do 2 times 7 times 3. 7 times 3 is 21, times 2 is 42. That's our answer. C. If you did want to keep the decimals, you could do so, or you can do 10 to the negative 1, 10 to the negative 1, right? And what that's going to give us is 42 times 10 to the negative 2, or 0.42, which is equal to 42%. But we didn't need to do that math all the way. You do not get partial credit for doing extra work. As long as you find the actual value here, 42, we don't need to prove that it's 42%. That's all we need. We can move on to our next question. And that's how to solve Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium questions that may come up on the MCAT. They don't come up often, but now you'll be able to do them accurately and fast. Please remember to subscribe to this channel if you have not already done so for more videos on MCAT content, test-taking strategy, and mental fitness tips. And if you'd like to join my next live online cohort with 40 plus hours of teaching with me, you can check out our next available class time in the caption below. Great work in this video, and as always, happy studying.